Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Neo Kobe Pizza, the only gaming podcast that floats in soup. My name is Mark B., and joining me today is a friend of mine, wonderful uh, live streamer through uh, Twitch, general all-around great guy, Mr. Joe Tran. How are you doing today, sir? I'm good. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm um, doing okay, thank you. So, I had reached out to you, as our mutual friend, Mr. Robert Hubbs, suggested that you might be interested in doing this sort of thing if you had the time available. And when I had suggested it to you, one of the first topics that you had come up with was just a general discussion of rhythm games, like their history, where they've come from, things like that. Yeah, because I mean, we're, we're I think if I remember right, we were, talk, we we're talking on a stream with, uh, between songs, and like we we're we were, we started talking about some well, a little bit of history of Project Diva, and then where where this came, where this, how this, how we got to where we're at, and this one from there. Exactly, and. I thought that that was a really good idea just in general because I've loved rhythm games for a while and from the live streams that I've seen that you do with the Project Diva series, it's clear that you love rhythm games in general and the Project Diva, Hatsune Miku, however you want to describe it, franchise in specific. But I also realized after the past couple of weeks of discussing musicals, musical video games, things of that nature, that we were kind of doing a disservice to the actual rhythm genre as a whole, where we were using it as a way to springboard into discussing musicals within the realm of video game narrative, but not actually really going into what was important about rhythm games, what was special about rhythm games, what was great about rhythm games. So it's it's... This felt like a really good opportunity to rectify that by talking to somebody who had that kind of passion about rhythm games so we could just go over where rhythm games came from, what makes them special, and why they continue to have something of an enduring legacy, even if it isn't as strong as it's been at its peak. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always nice to touch, up, touch on like, like just why we love, we love playing rhythm games. It's really interesting also to, to realize that the rhythm genre feels like it's a fairly long in the tooth or a fairly older genre, but we haven't actually had rhythm games of note, again, going back to the point made during the musical podcast, until the CD era was a viable thing. Yeah. We've had stuff that kind of existed as prototypical rhythm games. Like, I don't I don't know how much time you spent with these sorts of things back in the 80s, but I can distinctly remember as a small child playing with the Simon toy developed by Ralph Bayer back in like 78. No, Jesus. yeah. I think I think most kids of, of that era we, we played Simon at some at some point or another. Yeah, it's, it's it's not really a thing that's current now. I certainly haven't seen one in any case. I'm sure they're available if you go onto an Amazon or whatever, but Yeah. Back in the 80s that was a relatively big toy and it was just a, such a simple premise. You had four colored buttons and the device would light them up and make a noise for each of the buttons, you were supposed to remember in what order it did it, and then push the buttons. And it's not like we haven't seen mini games that do that sort of thing in various other games over the years, but it's that simple visual audio memory of, you know, red, green, blue, yellow, yellow, red, blue, green, whatever. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's something that kind of like started off the rhythm genre in a lot of respects, because at that point, that's the only thing that we could do. Yeah, man, it, it, it's really, it really is when you think about rhythm games and what their the core uh, aspects of their gameplay. It's, that's really what it is about, a, a, a pretty much memorization of a pattern. Yeah, and I, and I feel like that actually kind of informs where we've gone with rhythm games in general, where there's a certain amount of that pattern memorization. So it's it, it can definitely be considered kind of a forefather of the genre in a lot of respects, yeah. even if it was just basically a simple piece of plastic with four colored buttons on it. Yeah. But it's beyond that. I feel like the first instance of a video game trying to do that sort of thing was the game Dance Aerobics from Human Entertainment. This is both a game that is really old and really of minimal, you know, availability to most gamers due to, well, the fact that it was a Dance Aerobics game on the NES. <laughs> yeah, that and also like you think, if I'm right, that was used to power pad, right? Yes. And the power pad was also one of those things that I had always kind of figured was sort of a precursor to what we got later in the 90s with uh, like the dance pads that we saw from yeah. various manufacturers. But at the time, most people were just kind of using it for track and field, pretty much. Hey, well, that's, the, that's all really people even knew it for. Yeah, it's, it's, there's definitely there's been like a small handful of games that came out that utilized the, the tool otherwise, dance aerobics being one of them. 
But for the most part, it was it was a track and field path. Like, if you owned that, you owned track and field and probably nothing else. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I feel like the only other thing that you can look at and say this definitely has its roots in the rhythm game genre is probably the Genesis game Toe Jam and Earl. Like, that's, that's one of those kind of games that has, like, that niche appeal at this point where people still love the game to this day and still keep wondering why in the hell Sega doesn't love it very much. <laughs> but... It's it's not one of those games that was, you know, a multi-million seller, game of the year candidate that has this enduring legacy along the lines of like a Mario or Sonic. It was basically just kind of sort of a weird puzzle roguelike where you controlled two aliens who crash landed on the planet and were trying to escape while also being rappers for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember being a kid when that came out, like... I've ever tried. I've ever rented it one for one weekend, and like I didn't, I couldn't understand what, what I was supposed to even do. <laughs> oh no, absolutely not! It was, just so, it was so weird. That game was horribly impenetrable if you <laughs> did not have any kind of exposure to roguelikes. And even at that age, like I, I had played like one or two roguelike type games on the PC and Fatal Labyrinth on the Genesis. So I kind of understood where they were going, but I, I really just ended up having to call like Sega's 800 number and just be like what in the hell is this game and they had to, they had to send me like a little printed out strategy guide of sorts or the closest thing that you could approximate to that they actually sent you something oh yeah back in the day back in the day Sega's 800 number was great you would call them and they would it was free like it was totally yeah. free of charge you would call them up and you'd be like I can't do whatever in this game and they'd be like all right what's your name what's your address and they'd mail you like these this like printed photocopied multiple sheets of paper, depending upon the game that you called about, that just explained to you how to do stuff. Like, back when the original Fantasy Star came out, I called them up and I was like, I can't do this in Fantasy Star. And they sent me, I want to say it was like a 13 or a 14 page document, just explaining how to do everything in Fantasy Star. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. And again, it was an 800 number, so they weren't charging you anything. It was just, it was just kind of like customer support, except in that case, it was, here's how you do this. I don't know, it was just it was just one of those things that endeared me to Sega when I was a kid and kind of like stuck with me as I got older, I guess. Yeah, I can, well, I can imagine because I mean, that's like that's unheard of to me, really. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. at this point, like I imagine that if if 800 numbers and 900 numbers and whatnot were still a thing we used, every company were, would just have 900 numbers up to <laughs> give you tips on how to complete their games. Yeah. But the thing about Toe Jam and Earl that struck me as kind of like a predecessor to rhythm games was that the game, for no particular reason, it just had this beatboxing mode where you could just go in and press different buttons in a different random order and you know you could just get the characters to make goofy little noises to one of the soundtrack songs yeah and maybe this is just me but i had friends when i was growing up who were big into the idea of music creation at the time we didn't really have that kind of an outlet available where you could you know go join a band go do whatever when you're like 10 11 12 so he would hook up his genesis to his stereo system and he would, like, play soundtrack songs from the Genesis games and then, like, use the sound test while the songs were going on to record, like, sound mixes over these songs. <laughs> That's neat. Yeah, so it was you would have, like, I don't know, 80-minute and 100-minute audio tapes where he would just have, like, songs recorded from a game onto the tape with, like, you know, little, like, remixes based on the sound effects from the game that he would put together. And he would, like, write down what each of the different sound effects did and would flip back and forth between them to make the notes that he wanted to remix the song the way that he wanted to do it. So it's it's thinking about Toe Jam and Earl in that respect, it kind of, like it says to me, you know, we've done games since then that kind of utilize that sort of audio mixing, you know, that sort of put in the effects wherever you want to put them in, make the beat however you want to make it kind of stuff. And I guess to a certain extent, it probably bears mentioning that we had the Make Your Own Music video games that came out on the... Sega CD with uh, Criss Cross and CNC Music Factory. <laughs> uh, I, I had almost forgotten about those. <laughs> yeah, Alex brought them up in last week's podcast as kind of a, a predecessor to the idea of musical games as well. And it's I kind of feel like they, they sit in this category where y you can sort of say that there's like an, a, an interesting degree of musical composition to them as well as rhythm game mechanics, but... Honestly, they were just a really strange experiment that, that didn't seem to do very much of anything and didn't amount to very much. Especially with CNC Music Factory. I'm not sure why Sega thought that would be a thing that would appeal to Sega CD owners. 
Like, Criss Cross, at least, was in that age bracket where kids be, might be like, I remember them, they're the jump, jump guys, and want to <laughs> play a game with them. But, like, CNC Music Factory was literally, like, two really powerful female backup singers and this super roided-up shirtless dude who would just, like, rap about, like, ridiculous shit. And, like, that was that was decidedly not a thing that kids were into at all. Yeah, well, I mean, Sega had a lot of questionable things from the Sega, the Sega CD era. Yeah, and I, I love experimentation as much as the next person, unless that person loves some experimentation more than I do, which is entirely possible. <laughs> but, yeah, that was just not an experiment that went anywhere in particular. Nah. But it's all of these different ideas, you could kind of sort of see that somebody was trying to figure out, like, this this way, where they were saying, you know, music and video games is great, and if we could just figure out some way to do something with this, we could probably make a shitload of money. And then all of a sudden, in 1996, Sony showed up and said, We've got it. Have a dog rap against an onion. <laughs> yeah. And I just I just saw this on Twitter today, too. I don't remember who said it, so I swear I'm not trying to rip this off, but this is not my thing. I just want that noted. <clears throat> I just saw something on Twitter today where somebody just mentioned that, oh my god, Chop Chop Master Onion is actually a rap scallion. Oh my god. That are is you some, kidding me? That is some shit. But, yeah, so... The game that we are talking about, for, for those who've been not born at that point or living under a rock, is, of course, Parappa the Rappa, featuring the dog of the same name, who was, as the title implies, a rapper. And that game definitely served in the discussion that we were having previously as, as kind of like a beginning to the musical genre within gaming, because it had a very simple narrative that featured Parappa rapping his way out of problems, but it's also pretty much recognized as the first rhythm game ever. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it brought, like we were speaking earlier about uh, how the prior games had, had like little elements you could see. It was, it was really Parappa that really brought it all into one a whole and whole package. Yeah, and it was just such a ridiculous premise, too, just in general. <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's, it's this rapping dog who's like, I ultimately want to, at the end of the day, impress this girl that I'm romantically interested in, who is a talking flower for some reason. <laughs> but I'm secretly worried that she's really into this gigantic jock dog who, by all indications, she has no fucking interest in whatsoever. But Parappa is understandably nervous about this. And then he has to keep reminding himself, I gotta believe, before he goes into a <laughs> rap battle with, like, a, a fucking talking onion who knows yeah. martial arts it's and, the, like, uh, a moose. The, and, yeah, the, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the, drive, the drive instructor. The driving instructor, oh my god. And then, my favorite part is the part where he has to do, like, like a, a, a boss rush. Yeah. Where he has to go up against all of them, because they all have to piss. <laughs> so he has to outwrap all of the bosses from the previous stages, so that he can piss before they do. <laughs> I'd almost forgot about that. <laughs> Fucking Japan, Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Japan is just even back in the day. Japan is wacky as hell with their shit. <laughs> oh yeah, they have they have so many amazing games just in general, yeah. and it's 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 interesting to note that without Japan, we wouldn't have the rhythm genre as we understand it. Like it might still exist in some capacity, but not even remotely close to the level it does now, or in the ways that it does. Because a lot of the stuff, even even the popular Western games that we've seen come out, all to a certain extent, oh a debt to the Japanese way of producing rhythm games, just yeah. in general. Yeah, they really just laid down the foundation that everything is just really actually followed since. Definitely, and it's, it's, it's interesting, like, just keep that in mind as we go through. I'm not going to keep bringing it up throughout the whole podcast, but yeah. just keep that in mind. Everything that we talk about, in a lot of respects, either directly owes a debt to a game that was produced in Japan, or indirectly owes its functionality and structure to that. And it's it's really interesting to think, would the rhythm genre exist as it does now, if not for the Japanese marketplace? And what would that genre look like? Just something to consider. Yeah. But it's... Parappa the Rappa in and of itself wasn't necessarily the most popular game in the genre in general. Even at the time that it came out, it was neat and it was interesting, but amongst the Western audiences, I think it was more a curiosity because dog rapping against an onion yeah, in a karate game. <laughs> and it came with, like, a PlayStation... One of the PlayStation magazines, I want to say, had the demo of it, and it was, like, hyped up quite a bit. But it was not a game that kicked off a lot 
popularity wise on its own. No, definitely not. And for the Western marketplace, I think that's important because in Japan, around this time, rhythm games went fucking crazy. Oh, yeah, they did, especially in the arcades and the car arcade scene. Oh, yeah, make no mistake. If it wasn't for Konami at this point in the in the rhythm game genre, the arcades probably would have died in both the U.S. and Japan. Yeah. Right around, like, the late 90s. We probably would not have anything but the occasional, like, Dave and Busters or Yestercade keeping the arcade concept alive at this point in the West, and I don't even want to begin to imagine what Japan would look like. And it's it, it all comes down to a label that a lot of people probably have not thought of in a number of years, which is the, the Bimani style label. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, if anything I could think of from that era, from that era arcade, especially arcade-wise, it, it's Bimani is usually behind it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's you can start off with the first game that they released, which was Beat Mania, which was basically just like a, a, a goofy little keyboard uh, along with something that was meant to look like a, a record where you would play on the keyboard and do the record scratch as needed to kind of emulate being a DJ. And it, it, it wasn't the game that really struck gold in the West, but for Konami, it was a big hit. So they said, all right, let's keep trying again with this shit. And they, in rapid succession, just released so many different games, some of which never made even the remotest dent in the U.S., but in Japan were all big sellers, like big-name products, pop yeah. and music, Guitar Freaks, which we'll come back to later, but yes. not right now, <laughs> Drum Mania. And then, finally, you get into what is essentially Konami's crowning moment of awesome in the rhythm genre. Again, it pretty much needs no introduction if you've paid attention to gaming history at all, Dance Dance Revolution. Yeah, I think I'm pre- unless unless you're born in the last couple of years, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you're, every, there's everyone's at least heard of Dance Dance Revolution. Is this a so widespread? Of a, it was it was pretty much when it came out. It, it was pretty much a big giant phenomenon. Oh yeah, it, it's DDR. It, it cannot be understated. Saved the arcade. Yes. Turned Konami huge in record time. And was a hit beyond the likes of which we've seen up until probably like the Call of Duty franchise in terms of its market saturation, in terms of its effect on the genre, in terms of its overall profits. It, DDR at the time in the late 90s was, was massive. It was just insane in terms of how much proliferation, how much impact it had. Oh, definitely. I mean- they're, they're, I mean, if, if for any arcades that were still around in around the time, pretty much every, every arcade had had one. Oh, yeah, and it's DDR also launched a lot of careers indirectly because of its popularity and existence and just the whole Revolution brand name. I mean, these are things that we're going to come back to later, but it, it indirectly made a big push with the Karaoke Revolution branding. It turned Red Octane into a viable company financially through their high-quality home DDR pads yeah. that they made. It it was huge for a while, actually. I mean, the last DDR game that we've seen in any capacity, I want to say, was years ago at this point on the Xbox 360 and possibly the PS3. It's It's kind of sad that, like, the franchise is basically all but dead now. Because yeah. Konami. But in general, like DDR was a big thing for a number of different years from its launch in, again, like 1998 all the way up to looks like 2011 before Konami just finally turfed <laughs> that shit out, which is which is just really frustrating because it's it's a franchise that if they had taken care of it, they probably could have kept going longer. But. I've seen I've seen suppositions that Konami kind of sort of knew that they weren't going to do anything with it. Nope, no, it looks like they're actually releasing them still in the arcades uh, as of at least 2013 or 2014. Yeah. So that's something. But like from a console perspective, I feel like if you had taken care of that franchise more, you probably could have done more with it. But for the most part, like as as a home franchise, like they just beat that into the damn ground. Yeah, I mean. With how I I I've lost count of how many diff, how many different home releases there were across all the different consoles, especially especially on the PS2 the, on the PS2 era. I loved the different games for a while. I I loved the different things that they released in various capacities, as far as you know, 
what was available in the U.S. marketplace, things like that. But just going to the Wikipedia page and looking at the list for how many games were released, and we're talking just, you know, yeah. home games. The last game that they actually have listed at this point is... Well, the last game with that actual name associated with it appears to be stuff from the, what's called the Dancing Stage franchise. It looks like DDR Universe 3 is the last game for the Xbox 360 that came out globally, whereas Dance Dance Revolution 2 is the last one to come out for the Wii in 2011. Yeah. Beyond that, they have a bunch of stuff that was specifically non-US yeah. dependent or non-worldwide dependent and things that came out for mobile phones, things of that nature. But DDR2 for the Wii and Dance Dance Revolution for the Xbox 360, uh, both of which came out in 2011, are it for the console market by all indications. Like, there's, there's nothing else. 2011 is the death of the console version of DDR just in general. Yeah, which I, I also which I when I think about it, like this is something something we'll touch on a little later. Uh, th like really how uh, it's it kind of corresponds to how rhythm games had kind of died right around two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Yeah, and there's there's definitely a lot of reasons for that, which I think we can kind of get into at that point. But again, it's I I feel like DDR. Like if you just go to the Wikipedia entry list of Dance Dance Revolution video games and you just start scrolling, it's going to make you sick. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. There are just so damn many. And, like, did we really need DDRs for the Game Boy Color? Really? <laughs> I didn't even know there was a Game Boy Color one. This is, like, this is exclusively for Japan. Like, this is not oh, yeah. a U.S. release. But it's just, really? That was really a thing that we felt needed to exist, huh? Okay. <laughs> just on the PlayStation 2 alone, you've got six different, six different entries into this franchise's history. Yeah. On a console that was around for about 10 or so years, that's a little more than a game every two years, which is the kind of thing that we get mad at franchises like Madden and Assassin's Creed and Call of Duty for doing now. Yeah. And to be clear, these were also games where you would get repeated tracks across different versions, but there weren't really the significant mechanical updates that some franchises have tried to do in later years. Like, there aren't you know, significant distinguishing characteristics. It was just, you got a different music video and maybe a slightly different remix of a song. And that was, that was kind of it. It was really weird. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was yeah, like you said, it was primarily content and not, so, it, and I think that's kind of, that's kind of why, that, that probably leads to why like DDR started to fade for like general populace because it, it didn't offer anything new other than songs. It didn't really, uh, it didn't really, uh, like po uh, poked the interest of people, like you didn't really. I don't know what the. I don't know what word I'm looking for. It was just people trying to cash in. It was. Yeah. You had a franchise that came from a very specific novelty, the ability to play a video game in a way that provided a certain degree of exercise, if that was what you were looking for, while also allowing you to goof around and pretend that you could dance. And then these games became popular, and the company that made them popular didn't take care of it. They said, "Oh." we can try to take care of this and make sure that it has longevity for years to come by releasing them in a certain specific way and trying to make incremental but important upgrades as time goes on, or we can just push as many of these out the fucking door as possible, try to exploit the fad to the best of its capability to make the most amount of money in the least amount of time, and then just drive it into the ground. It's They didn't take care of it. They didn't especially care about the legacy or the branding or anything else. They just pushed out game after game after game after game because it made them money. Yeah, but it's, it's, to that same point, it's interesting when you think about it. They, uh, they, they drove the ground and companies out, but yet it, it somehow DDR still had still lasted a good while as opposed to some, some other franchises. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like DDR is probably the franchise with the most longevity, and I would imagine if Konami were to release a DDR game on the consoles tomorrow with a dance pad included, they could still probably make a decent buck off of it. Oh, definitely. I just, I don't think it's necessarily financially viable for them, considering they've all but murdered the Bimani brand name, the Bimani studio, in its sleep at this point. And having to try and put together a listing of artists would probably be a bit outside of their wheelhouse. But it's, it's interesting to see how much DDR influenced, and yet at the same point, how utterly irrelevant DDR is at this point. 
Yeah. So in the wake of DDR in general, we, we started to see a whole lot of other games, a whole lot of other companies see what Konami had done, say, me too, me too, and try to release various different games that either were DDR exactly or were the concept of DDR but applied in different ways. And I don't want to get too involved in the idea of discussing stuff that was biting off of the DDR brand name because we're literally going to be here all day if you get into <laughs> yeah. that sort of thing. But it's interesting to look at the games that were inspired by the sudden popularity of rhythm games in general and the the new hotness that was DDR in specific. Because you, you started seeing all kinds of crazy games coming from other companies. Like, for example, Sega went nuts with both Space Channel 5 and Samba de Amigo in relatively rapid succession. Not to mention the Jet Set Radio franchise, which, while not a rhythm game, definitely had heavy roots in music and a very specific stylism that yeah. could kind of sort of be attributed to what you could have seen from the urban Japan <laughs> aesthetic that, that DDR carried with it. Yeah. Um, Guitaru Man was another like one-shot niche title that, that came out around this time period and was kind of sort of trying to bite into that marketplace of the you know the hot new rhythm game without yeah. actively being one of Konami's dance slash plastic instrument games. Yeah. Also I saw another game that just popped in my head that had had some influences as far as music playing music into the gameplay, uh Res. Res, definitely. And that was originally a Dreamcast title, so it's I I feel like that one kind of sort of also falls into that like Jet Set Radio category where yeah you know there's there's a lot of Panzer Dragoon with music in that but Res is actually one of those games that's managed to have an enduring legacy for years at this point yeah between its PlayStation 2 release in the West its Xbox Live Arcade release not too long ago and its most recent release on the PlayStation VR it people love Res which is kind of surprising considering that it's never been like a huge system seller or anything like that. But it's as a niche title, it's it's one of the more well known. Uh, yeah, but it's actually it's it's surprising how how well how well loved and how it's still it's still around. <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, absolutely, and it's even outside of Res, you've got the spiritual successor in Child of Eden, which wasn't quite the big hit that Res was in terms of you know its niche marketing, but in a lot of respects, took what Res was trying to do to its logical conclusion. Yeah. I feel like a lot of these games that came out during this time period were not expressly good in the strictest sense of things. I mean, to be fair, I loved Samba de Amigo, and I love Space Channel 5. I thought they were neat. I thought Guitar Man was neat, too, but it's... You generally had this case where the games either weren't capturing the imaginations of the people that were playing them, they weren't, they weren't capturing the interest and the attention of the people who were playing the games, or they just were not especially interesting. Like, I remember the PlayStation 2 game Unison, which was very much an attempt to try and capitalize on the rhythm game popularity, but as kind of a launch title for the PS2, and oh my god, that game was just dire. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've t I don't think I've ever seen that, so I can just imagine if it does get coming from you. <laughs> it was it was a game that kind of sort of felt like it was about choreographed dancing or para para style dancing where they do like the arm motions to the to the heavy exclusion of all else. Yeah. Like feet motions can be incorporated, but they're not the point. And just the mechanics were frustrating, the gameplay was not very enjoyable, and the songs that they had you go through were just not particularly well chosen, shall we say. Yeah. I want to say that that game also actually featured, like, songs that were... Yeah, it featured licensed songs in both Japan and America. And the Japanese song list, they had some interesting stuff in there. Like, songs that probably, at the very least, would have been appealing to, you know, the weeb crowd in the U in the U.S., uh, you had, like, a Utada Hikaru song in there. Uh, you had a um, Ayumi Hamasaki song in there. You know, it was stuff that Japanese fans at that point probably would have appreciated. And if you put something like that out now, would probably at least have a small cult following. I think about it. Like, a lot of rhythm games from that that era, like, it's, we're, again, we're, we're, st we're, st we're still very much Japanese-based. Oh, yeah. And so 
so like most a lot of music, music type choices weren't things that uh, that the uh, U.S. population were either one familiar with or two and then on the same lines two uh, didn't really they weren't really into. Exactly, and it's the problem is you could to a certain extent at least look at the games that were quasi Japanese in terms of their song choices, and you could say you know what these games were not orally geared toward the pulse of the generation as far as the Western market goes. But people loved the the goofiness of the songs. They loved, you know, like, Captain Jack was fucking hilarious, even though, like, none of his songs were good in the traditional sense of things. Yeah. But then you, you look at, like, the songs that they would put in when these games were adapted to a Western market, and it's like, okay, for Unison, for example, they had Country Grammar from Nelly. What? <laughs> And there are just so many bands in here that either died in the 70s or that you probably don't remember now. Like, Sister Sledge and KC and the Sunshine Band are decidedly shit that my parents thought was corny. <laughs> yeah. While, you know, Aqua and Apollo 440 absolutely did not escape the, the 90s intact. The 90s intact. Let alone, you know, the, the time period where this game came out. Yeah. And it's just, oh my god. Like, just, just, you could tell that there was just no money invested into this. And for the most part, you know, Unison was just not a game that got over, well, it, it, it went over like a fart in church. Let's just call it what it is. <laughs> At least games like Samba de Amigo and Space Channel 5, you know, stuck to their roots. They were just weird and quirky and on a console nobody owned. You could only do so much to compete with DDR, and I don't think anybody really got what it was that DDR brought to the table with its weirdness combined with its easy accessibility. Because, like, I love Tycho Drum Master, for example, which came out around this time. I think it's neat. But nobody wanted to take these two plastic drumsticks and bang on a fucking plastic drum for X amount of time as part of, like, their rhythm game experience. This was this was just not a thing that we were going to see take off. And especially especially in comparison, if you've ever seen the actual the actual the actual arcade cab, it's the, the relative size of the drum for compare of uh, the drum on the, on the arcade cab as opposed to the, the little drum you got they, they included as a peripheral for console version. Oh yeah, like the drum in the arcade cabinet is massive, and the drum that you get for the home version, it's got a tiny surface area just in general. It's it's roughly about the size of a particularly large cereal bowl. <laughs> yeah, like the striking area is small. I I didn't I don't find it unresponsive. I just find it hard to hit what I want to hit, and because of the variance that they require in where you strike that particular thing, it's a game that requires a lot of practice. Yes, it's it's very particular. It's very precise, and it's it's just it's not a game that was ever going to get over especially well in the West due to its oddball peripheral and its oddball presentation and structure. Yeah, and, and with that, with the, with the size difference in a drum, it really doesn't it doesn't it didn't translate well as far as translating the gameplay from the arcade to the home the home experience. It's also worth noting, though, that around about this point, we also see what at the time probably came across as being a lot less important than it ended up being in the grand scheme of things for the history of rhythm games. And that's the birth of the company Harmonix. Yes, Harmonix is a company with a really interesting history, and, and it all kind of sort of intertwines into where the genre has gone, in that way back in 2001, they released their very first game on the PlayStation 2 in the quasi-obscure game Frequency. Now, Frequency was one of those games that I discovered entirely by accident. I, I still remember to this day, I got that game for like four dollars from a Kmart that was going out of business. <laughs> yeah, I think like two years after the game came out, and I loved it. It's the challenge that the game presents is, in a lot of respects, beyond me structurally as a player. Yeah, but I did love the weird aesthetic that the game had of you know the the wireframe spaceship going through these these weird wireframe tunnels. Yeah, trying to hit specific notes in proper timing that would allow you to complete parts of a song so that you could keep the whole song going for as long as possible by not screwing up when it came time to complete a section of the song over again in the tunnel that you had to go into. And I really felt like the genres that they utilized were just a really good mix. I felt that there was a really strong mix of songs included in that game that focused on trying to be something a Western audience might want to listen to. I mean... 
there were you know a couple of songs that 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 came up as kind of being out of place i will never be a fan of freeze pop sorry that, that, that's just not gonna happen <laughs> but you had stuff from like the crystal method orbit uh the dub pistols fear factory fear factory <laughs> yeah no jesus christ when the fuck was the last time you saw fear factory in anything <laughs> Pro- yeah, probably either that or I forget, I forget if it was if there's a Fear Factory in the Fall Out game. Oh, uh, Amplitude. Amp- yeah, I don't. There were a lot of different weird selections in that one. I don't know that there was one specific selection that that felt like it was kind of supposed to be. Oh wait, no, I think I know what you're talking about, Slipknot. Oh right, yeah. But it's it's just amazing that you had you know you had stuff from like major techno creators, Paul Oakenfold. You know, again. Uh, the Crystal Method, uh, BT. Yeah. BT. And then you had stuff from, you know, awesome quasi-industrial acts like The Curve uh, alongside semi-popular pop tr- uh, groups like No Doubt. It was a really interesting mix of stuff. And if you at all liked EDM at that point, it was it was an amazing thing. Uh, it was not a game that was particularly well-received. It was not a game that was particularly well-known. But it was quite good, and I mean, for me personally, it introduced me to a lot of interesting bands and to the company Harmonix. Though I think it's I think it's worth noting that um, one of the art directors at Harmonix, when asked about Frequency, his response was that it quote didn't sell very well. <laughs> and from every from everything I've heard, yeah, it didn't really sell. Well. It was it really wasn't advertised all that well either. No, I honestly did not hear of it until I saw it at the Kmart. Yeah. Like us, to be honest, I I didn't know about Fre- I honestly didn't know about Frequency until after Amplitude. Yeah, and, and Amplitude was their second game to come out, and which is interesting because that game didn't sell well either. But this is this is again by Harmonix's own observation, Amplitude was not a game that did especially well for them at all. But in in a lot of respects, it was a natural evolution of what they were trying to do within the rhythm genre. It took the same basic concept, but put everything on a flat line instead of a rotating group and made the breaks between songs more obvious so that you were just trying to hop from lane to lane before jumping back to the first lane and trying again to keep everything going in a more structured, understandable way. Yeah. And the songs that they had in general hit a lot more of a wide genre variety. Uh, So you had like, you know, uh, P.O.D., Garbage, uh, Quarashi, which is another band that was specifically notable in, I want to say, like, 2003 and at absolutely no other time in existence. Yeah. You know, Run DMC, Weezer, David Bowie. It was interesting, like, you know, looking at and think back to it, uh, like, the, the, the song list, the variety was, there's definitely a good variety among both games, but also, it was definitely, it was definitely, uh, it's definitely a lot, like, uh, in contrast to what I mentioned earlier, it's, it was definitely geared a lot more toward Western tastes. It really was. Like, Frequency was very much an EDM-heavy game. There were things that were in conflict to that to a certain extent, but Amplitude was a game that was geared a lot more towards a diverse audience with distinctly Western interests. Pink is a decidedly Western-friendly choice. It's a decidedly broad-appeal choice. David Bowie, decidedly broad-appeal choice. Papa Roach, at that point, smart move. You know, it's... yes. These were songs that were picked specifically to try and bring in the widest possible amount of people that you could get. And it's, you know, it it, it kind of creates a certain tonal disconnect just because, you know, you've got a game where Blink-182, Papa Roach, Pink, Slipknot, and Garbage are all sharing the same retail space. But it was interesting because it, it showed that Harmonix got the basic idea of we need to diversify. We need to try and make something for everyone. And the game didn't necessarily succeed, but you can see that they learned lessons at that point that were important for where they would go next. Yeah, and where, with, with where they led next is what pretty the, the, the big hit, uh, a big uh, milestone as far as, as far as the genre is concerned. Well, not just yet. Yeah, They did go into a direction that was important for the development of the genre, but they kind of took a pit stop into what was this brief period of time where, for 
reasons I don't 100% understand even now, karaoke games became a big fucking deal. Oh, all right. <laughs> for whatever reason. Yeah, from like 2003 to about 2005 in the rhythm genre, karaoke games were just the best. Just the most amazing thing. And I get it from the perspective of we had never really had the opportunity to have that kind of game. And I certainly loved the idea of it, make no mistake. But yeah. it was just so weird, you know? Like, karaoke was never a thing that got over in the West at all. Like, it was, it was something that you did. It was something that you would do with your drunk-ass friends. You would go out to the bar and... You would try to see who could murder, I don't know, a Johnny Cash song or Freebird or whatever, the, the, the least bad, before you got thrown the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. But Japan loves karaoke, for whatever reason. Like, you, you see references to the shit in anime all the time. Even in anime that came out as recently as last year, they, they have dedicated karaoke establishments where teenagers will go and sing songs. For whatever reason, Konami said, you know what? we're going to make a game called Karaoke Revolution off of the, the DDR brand name. And then they made two different versions of that game. The Japanese version of the game is kind of just a home karaoke game. Yeah. Scoring is not a particularly big part of that. But for the American audience, Konami turned to Harmonix and said, hey, you guys know how to do rhythm type games. Can you do something with this? And they said, I don't know, let's give it a shot. <laughs> And they made what was basically the, the, the gold standard for voice recognition in karaoke games to the point where we're still seeing that same overall style in these kind of games years later. The, the closest that you've got in competition in terms of how things are done is the SingStar franchise, which Sony launched roughly around the same time, that also does the same scoring mechanics, but handles the way it chooses to display its karaoke elements and handles its scoring differently. But I mean, otherwise, the, the games structurally are very much similar. You're given a song, you're showed what the lyrics are going to be, you sing them, and that's it. Yeah. Very weird. that and Because it just came out of nowhere and got really popular really quick and then turfed out just as quick. Yeah, I think well, I think it probably it, turf, it probably turfed out is because it 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 seemed it, after it, after after the honeymoon phase with everyone with getting experience it experience it, it just it didn't really it didn't really they didn't really take it anywhere. It was just it was just karaoke at home. Yeah, that's definitely true. I feel like it's also kind of worth noting that for as much guff as I just gave Konami for how they chose to handle. DDR. Yeah. Holy shit! The way Sony handled fucking SingStar is goddamn atrocious. <laughs> oh my god. Like, this is this is the thing. Konami did not handle the Karaoke Revolution franchise especially well. I do not want to pretend that they did. They released three Karaoke Revolution games... No, I'm sorry. Four Karaoke Revolution games in, I want to say, a three to four year window with Karaoke Revolution... Volume 2, Volume 3, and Party, with only nominal changes between each. And this was in an era where you had to get the karaoke versions of those songs, meaning that they weren't the original releases, which we've come to expect now, but it was somebody else pretending that they were Michael Jackson while you pretended that you were also Michael Jackson. <laughs> like, this is like four games within a three- to four-year window, so it's, you know, just squeezing that fucking stone trying to get every last drop of blood out of it. Yeah, just like they did with DDR. <laughs> yeah, and then it like within within another year you had the American Idol licensed version of the game and then they released a a Karaoke Revolution Country for some ridiculous ass reason. Oh yeah, god, I forgot about that. I didn't want to remember that. <laughs> oh, I I not only do I remember that game, I reviewed that game and I fucking hated that game. <laughs> Oh, I can imagine. To be clear, I like country music. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But even as a fan of country music, the song choices in that game were fucking atrocious. But then it's it's and then American Idol Encore came out, and up until the point where American Idol came out, they had kind of sort of kept the games localized to you know one or two platforms. Party being the one example that, of them breaking from that by having that on the PS2, the Xbox, and the GameCube. 
American Idol Encore, they released for every goddamn console available. The Xbox 360, the PS2, the PS3, the Wii. And then they made another Encore. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No! I don't even know how you have more than one Encore, but apparently that's a thing. So they released another one, and they brought it out for the 360, the PS3, and the Wii. You would think that would be the end of it, but, but no. no! They brought out another game that was like a quasi-reboot of Karaoke Revolution. Oh god. <laughs> and I want to I want to say that that was the end cuz that that was the last game that I played in the franchise that that yeah. I can recall under Konami's banner. They they tried to reboot it in 2009 after beating the shit out of that franchise uh including, you know, trying to ape what other games have been doing up to that point. It was still using crappy karaoke versions of the songs, but it seemed like Konami roughly had an idea of where to go with it, and no, that game got absolutely turfed the hell out. But then you go to Sing Star, Jesus Christ, <laughs> just on the PS2, just on the PS2, you yeah. had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21! Are you, are you fucking kidding me? No! Oh, oh my god. Now, That's I do want to note, this is across all territories. The the U.S., but the U.S. still saw, like, 15 of those 21 releases. And this is just on the PS2. Yeah. A console that had a 10-year lifespan. Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm also leaving out all the fucking licensed versions with, like, ABBA and Queen and oh. Motown. <laughs> the, the U.S. releases just on the PS2 are over 20 at this point. And... Sony Sony beat that fucking franchise to death. We're talking two games came out in 2004, three games in 2005, three games in 2006, four games in 2007, three in two... Th no, five games in 2007, because the, the, the PS3 version came out at the same point. Dude, and, Jesus and, Christ. And, and the thing, there are people complain about an annual franchises like Call of Duty and, and so and Madden. Oh, yeah, no, the, 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 the king... The king of releasing just lots of extraneous bullshit is, is the SingStar franchise. It's not even oh close. <laughs> At this point, SingStar is still kind of around. Uh, Sony has released two different versions of it on the PlayStation 3. And uh, I believe a version, yeah, um, SingStar Ultimate Party on the PlayStation 4, which kind of sort of work off of just giving you a disc full of X amount of songs and then access to a song store where you can just grab whatever you want and install it. They've changed the song store a few times, and unfortunately, I've lost access to some of the songs that I paid money for, which is not great. Yeah. But at the very least, Sony, despite just wringing the blood out of that fucking stone, has at least managed to keep the SingStar franchise alive to a certain extent by using master recordings and music videos of songs that people wanted to play and getting into the digital marketplace quickly and effectively long before Konami even thought about it. So, yeah. to their credit, they handled that smartly. But yeah, if, if you want to know why the the karaoke genre lived and died so in such a bright flare... It's easy, easy, easy finger to point there. Yeah. It's... Oh my god. <laughs> so, Harmonix clearly saw the writing on the wall as far as that went when they had to probably develop the third game in two years using the same basic frameworks. And it was around about that point that they started kind of canvassing Konami saying, hey, why don't we do something with Guitar Freaks? And Konami said, fuck that, that game's not going to make any money, get the fuck out of here, go back to making your stupid singing games. So Harmonix said, all right, well, if you're not going to do anything with it, we should. So they called up Red Octane, because Red Octane had been making DDR pads for years and years, and had kind of a casual relationship with great hardware development and Konami, and they said, hey, Red Octane, why don't we make a guitar game? And Red Octane said, okay, let's give it a shot. And then Guitar Hero is probably one of the truly last Wild West outlaw games to come out in the console marketplace, I think. Yeah. That was entirely funded pretty much by Harmonix and Red Octane using the core concept of the Guitar Freak structure, though adding in an additional fret that the Konami games did not have. 
and featuring, I want to say that game was mostly all Master Tracks. Uh, I think, yeah, I think it was, I think the uh, majority of it was Masters. I think there was, there's only, I think, I can only think of maybe two or three songs from that, from that, from that set list that were, that were, they, 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 they used a cover band. Yeah, and they used, to be fair, like more than a few quasi-indie bands, which is a trend that they've continued on with for years, but. Yeah. They also managed to get a lot of really important names within the genre onto that game. And that's not nothing. No. <laughs> and it's, as, as we have alluded to time and again throughout this particular podcast, it cannot be overstated how important Guitar Hero was to the genre. And again, I know I say in general, this can't be overstated or that can't be overstated, but these were big events. You know, Harmonix's birth and subsequent success through the, the uh, karaoke games might not be a big deal, but it all leads up to this moment. Oh yeah, I mean, Guitar Hero was huge. I remember when that when it came, when it first came out, they, a friend of mine had a friend of mine had uh, he he uh, he let me in he let me know about the game before it came out. I looked into into it. I found it interesting. I, so I had pre ordered. I fell in love with playing the game when it when that actually when it, when it actually got my hands on it just because it, it it literally made me feel like a rock star <laughs> and it, it that that feeling transitioned to well. It, people's fantasies about being a rock star. Oh yeah, it's 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 really important to realize that the full body experience games did a lot better than the games that just utilize the controller and tactile response for a while. Yeah. Because they tapped into a very specific urge amongst players. DDR told players, "You're not bad at dancing." I mean, you probably are, but I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> rock it on rock it on this pad. Do some shit. And Guitar Hero told them, you might be good at playing guitar. You probably aren't, and you really shouldn't try unless you really want to spend that time learning. But as far as I'm concerned, you're a rock god. Get that shit done. <laughs> yeah. Harmonix turned out a really damn good product with the first Guitar Hero, which was awesome. It was, oh, it was amazing. It, it was it, it, just an amazing franchise that would, they... they they built with love and care. They clearly gave a shit about this franchise, and they clearly gave a shit about making it the best that they very could, the very best that they could. Oh, definitely. I mean, they they took a lot of consideration into the the general mechanics, the introduced game mechanics. They also took a lot of care into uh, what which what the the song list, what uh, what kind, what the song, what uh, what would actually people be playing, and it's catered really again back catered back to the what more, more Western. Uh, catered audience, but it's a lot, a lot of variety of stuff that caters to not just anything recent, like recent of, of, to the time. I kind of wonder what would have happened if Harmonix had just managed to keep hold of the Guitar Hero franchise exclusively on their own, and had just kept that going at their own schedule, at their own pace, yeah. without anybody else's involvement. But, unfortunately, we don't live in that world. No, um, a lot of us know what happened. <laughs> Yeah, it's even if you even if you didn't pay attention, even if you weren't really in the video game genre at that point, you know what happened because without telling you, we've already told you what happened. But in this case, this starts off with a name that many of you out there will be familiar with, but maybe not necessarily because of the rhythm genre, and that's Activision. Somewhere between the first and the second Guitar Heroes, Activision got directly involved in the process, presumably funding Harmonix and Red Octane. By all indications, they bought out Red Octane outright, which is going to be important later and really yeah. depressing. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. And they said, all right, make more Guitar Hero games. And Guitar Hero essentially just became like the, the next coming of Christ for, for all logistical intents and purposes in the rhythm game genre. Oh yeah, I mean, so especially like right, just prior to this, like hey, Guitar Hero had blew it up, blown up, but then when Guitar Hero Two came out, that just it made it explode. Guitar Hero was important, and it got the name out there. Yeah. Guitar Hero Two was massive. I had not expected Guitar Hero Two to be anywhere near as big as it was. No, I, I, I really, I really don't think anyone did. I mean. 
I, I know my I know myself. Like I, yeah, I I enjoyed the hell out of Guitar Hero, the original Guitar Hero. So when I heard it making a sequel, I got excited. But this how as far as how how it blew, blew, blew up in popularity it was insane. And but I, part of that could be attributed to like with people the people who the people who had bought into Guitar Hero One, they got they went they went around like I know I did uh, went around to breaking the guitar the game and the guitar over to a friend friend's house and showing them game and it just picked up from there <laughs> yeah i actually want to note i was just like looking up other things to try and supplement this and I, I realized i had it backwards red octane actually approached harmonics about developing the guitar hero franchise uh, which is even more interesting because it would be it's interesting to think about what would have happened if harmonics had never been approached and where rhythm games would have gone at that point yeah but yeah so Eventually, at some point in this, Red Octane was bought out outright around this time period by Activision. Because Red Octane technically owned the Guitar Hero franchise, since they were the ones that initially came up with the idea. Yeah. So, Guitar Hero was bought outright. Red Octane was bought outright. Harmonix was kept on board for a bit. But then, interestingly, Harmonix was not purchased by Activision. But they were purchased by MTV. Oh, yeah, I remember that now. <laughs> oh, at the time, it was really weird trying to figure out why what happened next happened. But in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. Two major companies wanted to get involved into the ever-expanding rhythm game genre. And there were two companies available to be purchased. Activision probably could have sewed up everything right then and there. But yeah. they only really wanted Red Octane and the Guitar Hero brand name, figuring... Worst case, they could have their own people develop it, which they did in Neversoft. Yeah. While MTV came in and said, you know what? Let's let's invest in harmonics. Let's see what we can do with that. Let's see if we can make something that isn't necessarily Guitar Hero. And they did. And we'll get to that in a second. But Guitar Hero then continues on with Neversoft and goes through the exact same cycle that all of the other games that we've talked about went through in that a lot of different games were released that were just not particularly viable insofar as it comes down to trying to take care of the genre. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's, it's very telling that Guitar Hero itself has gone through multiple different developers at this point because the, the two that are most notable, Harmonix and Neversoft, are not even close to the only developers who've had their fingers in that particular pie. Yeah. And it's it's also really notable that Guitar Hero itself just kind of, what, it debuted in 2005 at this point? like two, Yeah, 2005. 2005. And by 2010, it was almost dead. Yeah. But in that, that can be attributed to a number of things from, well, like, well, Looking at the timeline, really, 2009 was the key the major year that really killed, led to that demise. Yeah, and it's, I mean, to be fair, there was a big recession in the 2000s, obviously, which made yeah. it difficult for everyone to invest in games to a certain extent. So, you know, it's you were not going to get into a position where developers were going to keep investing money into things that might have needed more time. And you also started seeing developers get impatient to make that turnaround, which we're, we're still kind of seeing today. Uh, you can go back to previous discussions about things like DLC and whatnot to get an opinion of where that has ultimately evolved for the worse. But the key point is that Guitar Hero rapidly became a franchise that was about slapping a name onto a game and trying to make as much money off of it as possible. Yeah. I mean, Guitar Hero itself has had... I want to say seven major entries in the franchise because there were the first three Guitar Heroes. There's the first as far as like main as far as main entries. Yeah, there's, there's the first three. There's World Tour, which I think people consider as four. Right. And then there's there's Guitar Hero Five in two thousand nine. And then right after that, there was Warriors of Rock, which was I think the last game in the NeverSoft version. Yeah. And then we got Guitar Hero Live just last year. Yep. So that's seven. All right. Yeah. The first three games were 100% just play that damn guitar like your life depends on it. And I think here 
is probably where the franchise started to lose its way. But before we talk about that, we probably need to talk about the other reason it lost its way, aside from bad financial decisions. Yeah. And that brings us to Rock Band. Yes. So when MTV bought Harmonix, they said, hey, we want you to make one of those guitar games. And they're like, well, we can't do Guitar Hero. And MTV, I don't give a shit. We don't care what you call it. Just do it. And Harmonix was probably, I don't know for certain who came up with what idea as far as it goes. So this is not an authoritative solution. But somewhere in the process, somebody says, why don't we just make a game about playing as a whole band? And MTV's like, fucking greenlight it. Do it. Let's go. And suddenly, you have a game that is now based around multiple instrumental parts. So you've got a singing game, which Harmonix has already done successfully yep. several times in Karaoke Revolution. A guitar and a bass game, which Konami, which uh, Harmonix has done successfully several times in Guitar Hero. Yeah. So all they have to do is figure out the fucking drum mechanics. And it's not like they don't have a great template to start from. Yeah, that and also, uh, if I remember right, uh, the, a good chunk of Harmonix staff were mus- musicians themselves. So they, they are, it's, not like, it's not like they're going in blind trying to figure this, figure this, figuring it out. Yeah, and from a tech perspective, they could, they could look to another Konami game that never came out to the States that definitely had an influence on their process in Dramania. Yeah. So here we are with a company that clearly has a framework that they can put together and implement into one base game. So they do that with what is quite possibly one of the most transcendent experiences released at that point, Rock Band. Oh, I, rock, I remember when Rock Band came out. That was just inc- the whole the whole idea was incredible. Being able to have a whole band, but then that being able to like. Uh, taken off from the, what I mentioned earlier, how people would take with Guitar Hero, people would take the take their game and the guitars to over to friends' relatives' house, and they they all play together. Having having a full a full rock band, it basically makes it makes it a giant party game too for everyone. They get, you have get more people involved. So it actually makes it more makes it more it made it more interesting to the consumers' eyes too. Oh, yeah, and, and Rock Band in particular was structured in a very specific way that made it an amazing party experience. You had in, I don't necessarily want to th- say in the first entry, but in later entries, definitely, you had that drop-in, drop-out play where yeah. somebody could just come in, play a song, and leave if they wanted to. You had instruments that offered full tutorials, so if somebody really wanted to learn the specifics, they could do that within a couple of minutes. You had multiple difficulty selections, and everybody could play at different difficulty levels, so... If you owned the game and you were really good at guitar and yeah. you had a friend who was really good at singing, but you had a bass friend who was only okay-ish and a drum friend who was terrible, that's fine. Everybody yeah. can pick different difficulties. So you could even just have your drunk friends jump in, sing whatever the hell they wanted to sing while you actually tried to play the game. And it, it allowed you to have fun no matter what your skill level was. And there's and there's even there's even game mechanics based around that idea like you could if say yeah, if say one person was really bad and they kept failing out, even even on lower difficulty, you had star power, you could bring them back in. Oh yeah, and even if they failed out, if they failed out late enough in the song, you could still carry the rest of that song to victory. So even if they crapped out, yeah. so long as it wasn't like in the first thirty seconds, you were probably okay. Yeah. For an illustration of how popular rhythm games were at this point in two thousand and eight. The rhythm genre was the second most popular video game genre in the U.S. <laughs> I can believe that. Right, the only one that was more popular was the very generically titled action genre, which is almost certainly due to probably the Call of Duty franchise and FPSs in general. Yeah. Not only that, at this point, over 50% of players in that genre were women, and Rhythm games, just in general, represented pretty close to 20% of video game real estate at that point. (laughs) Which, holy fucking shit! (laughs) Yeah. Like, it's amazing now to look at that time period and realize 20% of the games that you could go and buy in the store were rhythm games, and it was the second most popular genre out there. Yeah, it's insane to even think about Especially with like with with how big the industry was growing at that point, with how, just, uh, it was uh, video games were huge in, as far as mainstream. So the, the number of games that were out at that time was insane. I mean, you think in uh, that consideration, you think twenty percent were, were rhythm games. Like holy shit! Yeah, and it's the problem is is that 
from 2008 to 2009, both companies ultimately went down the exact same shitty road of deciding that because they were doing well, more is better, and the more you can get out there, the more money that you can make, the more products you can have available, the better off you are. It's worth noting that Rock Band itself, at that point, I want to say, was itself only like one or two years old. Yeah. Here you are. The Guitar Hero just came out in 2005. Rock Band comes out, I want it's to say... 2007. 2007. All right. These two franchises are competing neck and neck, and the very next year, 2008, is a banner year for rhythm games. Both franchises make a shitload of money. And we're going into 2009, and this is, this is going to be a big year for both companies. So what do they do? They beat that shit into the fucking ground. They, yeah, they beat, that ho- they beat the dead horse again and again. Holy shit. I remember, I, I was, and it's, it's not only, not only, you, with, not only did it beat the horse of, the, of, their, of those respective franchises, Activision also beat the horse in, with uh, spinoff games. Yeah, and it's just, oh my god, so many just games came out in that year. Rock Band 3 came out at that point, which the only significant addition that that added was the ability to use Eliza Keyboard, which... Which no one really ever used. Nobody used it. It died in that franchise. The the more recent Rock Band 4 did not even bother to bring it back, and none of the sub-games that they created really had anything to do with that keyboard. Yeah. Guitar Hero started its expansion into the... Different bands. ...wide-scale plastic instrument part of the genre the prior year in 2008 with World Tour, which yeah. was, you know, where they went into being rock band as well. And then Guitar Hero 5 was, the like, the next major entry of sometime in 2009. I don't... I don't... Uh, September of 2009. Yeah, somewhere around that. Yeah, and that was that was their attempt at just trying to rebuild that. And it's there were there were issues just in general. That was the year where we had the Kurt Cobain controversy, for example. Yeah. But it, it was just there was just too much. Plastic instrument sales dropped off because of course they did. How many fucking guitars does a person really need? Come on. Yeah, they like they did a new guitar release for every 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 year for each for each new game. Yeah, and the guitars were all unilaterally compatible between platforms, so it wasn't like you needed six guitars. You could get one Guitar Hero guitar, one Rock Band guitar, and that would probably set you well for the next several years. The drum kits were dramatically different, and if anything, I feel like that created a need for a specific sort of brand loyalty, where if you had a drum kit, what the fuck did you need another drum kit for? I know, I mean... The, 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 as far as like ba- the basic drum kits, I remember the rock the rock band drum kit was just, was quite different than to what the drum kit they had for Guitar Hero World Tour. Yes. So it, it, it that that was where he started to divide as far as the drum as far as the drum sections or drum kits were, and it's not that's not even taking consideration the the, the pro kits. Oh God, the pro kits. <laughs> that was a really heavily underthought idea, just in general. Yeah. Pro instruments for these games in a market that was already starting to eat itself alive was just... That was a really optimistic point of view. I think. Yeah, I mean, they, at that, I think at that point, I think at that point, they, like, at the bad point when they had started introducing the pro- professional instruments, it was more... It, it, was, it was where John was starting to pick up, but then they murdered. They murdered it into the ground at around that same time, with some, with multiple releases of games within a year. Yeah, and it's it's worth noting the Rock Band franchise suffered just as much as the Guitar Hero franchise oh, did. De- oh, definitely. In terms of like games that were available and whatnot, it's really worth noting here that both companies, both Harmonix with their MTV backing and Guitar Hero, with its Activision backing, just started pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Guitar Hero not only saw, you know, World Tour and then Guitar Hero 5 without a dramatic change to the structures, on top of licensed, like, side games at that point, like Band Hero, 
which <laughs> yeah. was very specifically a a pop rock oriented sort of release, as well as Guitar Hero specific themed games. Yeah, uh, like Metallica. Guitar Hero Metallica. Yeah, that Van was, Halen. Van Halen. That was another big one. Aerosmith. Yeah, and then Rock Band had did the same thing. Their Beatles Rock Band. Yeah, ACDC Rock Band, Green Day Rock Band, yeah. Lego Rock Band. Lego Rock Band, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to seem like, oh, well, these were all terrible ideas, because a lot of those bands had the staying power to make those games worthwhile. They had yeah. the capability to exist and be important. But here's the thing. That's three different band-licensed games per franchise within this same five-year period that these, you know, three, four, five, six games came out, on top of an odd subgenre spinoff. These companies basically assumed that you had that kind of dedication to where you were going to pay for, and if we're talking about the Guitar Hero franchise in particular, ten games in five years. Yeah, and is this not even counting all, all the, uh, the downloadable content for our songs? Yeah. The downloadable content clearly was a moneymaker. Oh, definitely. That clearly carried those companies long past the point where the actual plastic instruments and whatnot ceased to do so. But it's just so weird to look at the situation and to realize that nobody learned anything from DDR. No, not at all. Nobody learned anything from Karaoke Revolution. And Harmonix was involved in Karaoke Revolution. So you think they, in particular, would have realized, this is a bad idea. If yeah. we keep doing this, we are literally going to lose our jobs. But it makes it also makes you think, like, how, with, with, the, with these later years we were talking about, with all these releases, how, how, much, how, much, of a, how much say did Harmonix have in, the, in these games, in releasing them, in developing them? <sighs> Yeah, that's that's really kind of the big problem, isn't it? Because it's more than likely that MTV probably just said more and they didn't really have a choice in it. But it's you would you would think that Harmonix should have been able to at least look point to them and say, listen, this could keep going if we don't oversaturate the market and that somebody might have listened. But it's it's. You would you would think that somebody somewhere would have realized that this was a bad idea just from looking at how DDR died. Yeah. And no, we got 10 different Guitar Hero games in a five-year period. And what was it, like six core rock band games on top of the handheld games, which Jesus Christ, the handheld <laughs> games. Oh, God. You had to put this, like, ridiculous freaking, like, strum bar attachment onto your, I want to say it was DS. Yeah. And press the buttons, like, to play while you were strumming on the bottom screen. It was, really? Okay. All right, whatever. And you had those games. Harmonix released a Amplitude-style rock band game on the Xbox Live Arcade. It was just so many different attempts to ring blood out of that same fucking stone. Yeah. It just caught this uh pretty just copy paste the formula and just throw, just do it again and again. And I think it kind of I think one of the major problems was that both companies kind of overestimated the ability of an individual brand name attached to the gaming brand name to sell copies. Yeah. Because I don't recall hearing anything about any of the six spin-off games doing any kind of particularly good money. Oh, I know. And also, uh, probably also didn't help is like, you got these two big franchises that are competing. Against, they're they're both they're both huge, and they're competing against each other for the the, the for the market. People have is again going back. You kind of touched back on what you mentioned about loyal brand loyalty. Like you with all these releases from each franchise, like. How can it, how you know, how can the uh, pe uh, populace will decide which to go with, and they just there are, people just got fed up with it. Yeah, and it's if it had just been the games, I think like players probably wouldn't have been that upset. But it was you had to have two different drum kits if you wanted to play both different games to the maximum capability. Yeah, new instruments came out every single year, and there was definitely a push to try and release as many of these different games as humanly possible. It was really tough 
for them to market that product in an effective way. And again, it's you've also got this situation where the companies are trying to market pr- not just the core products, but products that were directly based around specific musical acts. And it's not only that, it, it's you, you are actively trying to cash in on the idea that XYZ particular game is notable, is something that you should want because you love this band and you want to have access to songs from this band. And it's, I don't, I feel like the Rock Band franchise, the Guitar Hero franchise worked better because there were so many different games available, so many different songs available that could be integrated with one another. Yeah. And I don't think Guitar Hero ever got that in general because they were slow on the uptake when it came to attempting to integrate song packs into other products. But in specific, I don't think they got it because like Metallica was never that band. You know, no. they were they were never that big. Yeah, and especially especially their relevance at that time that that time uh, that point in time. Oh yeah, absolutely. We're talking that came out in two thousand and eight, which was not peak Metallica at that point. That was God, Death Magnetic. <laughs> I'm not even sure. <laughs> I want to say I want to say that that was part of the controversy with Death Magnetic where it sounded better in Guitar Hero than it did in the actual disc version. <laughs> like, that's that's not a joke. That's, like, literally a fucking oh, problem God. that they had. That's, that's absurd. Yeah, Death Magnetic came out in 2008, and that was absolutely not peak Metallica from any perspective whatsoever. People, you know, there were complaints that it sounded better in Guitar Hero than it did on the disc. The reception was generally kind of back and forth overall it it scored high but there were a lot of people that were were critical of what it sounded like comparatively the overall chart performance was fine ish but if you look at their overall like their overall discography that one was 2x platinum which is not their best no. Before that, like if they, if that had been something that could have happened like during the load and reload era when they were getting like four or five times platinum, or yeah. God, the black album, which was fucking oh, sixteen times platinum, yeah. They they would have been amazing. Two X platinum at that point, that was you're kind of doing this just because it's, you know, the lifetime achievement award for the band, more or less. Yeah. Also, Death Magnetic is the vagina coffin record for those of you who don't really follow Metallica, but you vaguely remember that period where everybody called the Death Magnetic record. Oh, it's the thing that where there's a coffin on the front that kind of looks like a vagina. <laughs> so if your Metallica is kind of rusty, there you go. Van Halen also not like really more of a lifetime achievement award kind of thing. Aerosmith doubly. So these were all bands that were really relevant in the late 90s and the early 2000s who were seeing games made about their life and times in 2008, which wasn't the best possible no. choice comparatively. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not like Rock Band did any better. ACDC hadn't been relevant by that point since like the early '90s. And yeah. while we all love Big Balls and right and you know um, Back in Black, it's ACDC as a band had been out of favor for some time. The Beatles at least made sense from a lifetime longevity award, but by all indications, the dealings that they had with Yoko Ono and I want to say George Harrison's wife. Uh, not really sure. I know Yoko Ono was a big part of the problem with this. Like, I don't... From everything that I had heard, like, Paul McCartney and Ringo were just kind of like, yeah, do it, whatever. They were just happy to have the license back at that point. Yeah. But Yoko was very much a stickler about how they handled specific aspects of things to the point where you could not play the Beatles songs outside of the Beatles disc, which was frustrating for a lot of players, myself included. And Green Day was at least relevant at the time that their particular version of the game came out. Yeah. Because I want to say... Yeah, that came out, like, right at the the end. That came out right at the end. That was the last one of those things that was... of those genres, those band-specific games that was released. Yeah. And I want to say that, yes, American Idiot had been released prior to that. So they were at the highest possible point they could have been in terms of notoriety and popularity. 
but 2010 was basically where the genre died. It was a lot of people who had a lot of great ideas and had no concept of how to parse this. So you were getting two games a year per company that required different drum kits. So you, you, you essentially had to have these two gigantic drum sets if you wanted to play every possible song that was available. And yeah. you had to invest $240 into discs that were just based around plastic instruments. <laughs> the games were incompatible with one another, obviously. Some of the games weren't even compatible in their own particular franchises. Some of the Guitar Hero games didn't translate well from one to the next. Yeah. It, yeah, it just got to be a big convoluted mess that of oversaturation and poor design decisions. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, this the, no, the sheer number of games that they released in that in that in that two year time span of two thousand eight two thousand nine was absurd. <laughs> and of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention that way after the point where it would have been completely reasonable to do so, and way, way after the point where it would have made them pioneers in the industry and probably made them all the money if they had done it, Konami finally decided to release their own plastic instrument video game dubbed Rock Revolution. Oh, God. <laughs> I would forgotten about that. Yeah, so did everybody else. The, <laughs> the instruments were trash. The song list was not particularly good. All of the songs were cover band songs, because Konami is cheap, if nothing else. And the one thing that might have actually given them an edge, where they could have potentially licensed their own stuff to try and, you know, make the game at least a mild novelty for collectors who already had plastic instruments, Yeah, they didn't even try. It was just all shitty covers. <laughs> Nobody liked the game, the game did not score particularly well, and that was, by all indications, the death of Konami's interest in the rhythm genre in general. After the death of Karaoke Revolution, Dance Dance Revolution, and Rock Revolution, outside of the odd DDR side project here and there, they pretty much just gave up on the Bimani brand name and everything associated with it, put that shit aside, and went back to fucking up Silent Hill for years. Fuck up Silent Hill and Metal Gear. 2010 marks, what was this now, the third fucking death of the rhythm genre at that point? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Uh, so, you would think that would be the end of the conversation, but what? not no. so much. While Rock Band and Guitar Hero both went on an extended hiatus until recently, a couple of companies tried to release games that were a little bit more serious, including Power Gig, Rise of the Six String, which didn't go anywhere yeah. particularly interesting, yeah. Rocksmith. and Rocksmith, which still continues to hang on to this day. Somehow. Within two years, the rhythm game genre went from being the second most popular in the marketplace to being, quote, well past its prime, unquote, and downloadable versions of games became the focal point. MTV, now Viacom, sold off Harmonix to an investment group, but continued to allow it to work on the Rock Band franchise, while they ultimately ended up developing what was quite possibly one of the very few good games for the Kinect in the Dance Central series. Oh, yes. Activision, meanwhile, murdered the Guitar Hero franchise outright, dissolved Neversoft, and basically pretended that the whole thing didn't exist anymore. So, Red Octane is dissolved, Neversoft is dissolved, Guitar Hero is put on the shelf... Rock Band is shelved, saved for the downloadable content market, which for Rock Band at least was still a popular thing, thanks to support from independent creators who would upload their own tracks and release them at a reduced cost. And Dance Central is at least kind of sort of still relevant for Harmonix, so they, they continue kicking around for a while. And the odd era of motion-based dancing games kind of kicks in here for a couple of years. Oh, yeah. So you had, we had Harmonix did Dance Central, and then once that started taking off, it was what, Ubisoft, I think it was? Which, uh, Just Dance? Yep. And we also started seeing the odd dancing minigames crammed into Kinect games that had no support for it. I'm sure you've probably, at least in passing, heard of the, the Star Wars Kinect dancing minigame featuring the odd cover... the odd mashup mock-up cover song I'm Han Solo. Okay, I think I've heard of it. Featuring a, a fucking dancing Han Solo while you did the Kinect motions. <laughs> oh my god. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I might have to look that up later. Yeah, so for, for a couple of years, motion control becomes all the rage in so far as rhythm games go. We get, again, Just Dance. We get Dance Central. Uh, they also released Michael Jackson, the game, which kind of was here and there as far as recognizability goes. A bunch of second-tier companies start releasing dancing games for the Kinect, for the Wii, uh, for the Move, where they, they don't have the notability of something like an Ubisoft or the, the Dance Central product or what have you. Yeah. But they still at least try to cash in on motion controls in a format that people are actively willing to accept those sorts of mechanics. And that, hmm. for a while, is kind of just where rhythm games ended up being. Yeah. And, I mean, to be fair, it kept harmonics alive for a while. It Dance Central was one of the highest-selling games on the Xbox 360 yeah. for a number of years. Yeah, I mean, it was, the re- it was pretty much the reason to have a connect. And then, around about that point, two things happened. Well, three things happened. The first, motion controls, just in general, just died a painful death. Yeah. I think when after people... Uh, motion, control, motion controls became a thing thanks to the Wii, but then after after the novelty wore off, then no one was... No developers were really doing anything really particularly interesting with motion controls. Yeah. Pe- people were like, okay, I'm just, I'm just standing here waggling a stick. Pretty much. To their credit, Ubisoft is still kicking along with the Just Dance franchise, but Harmonix ultimately put the Dance Central series to bed after the third game. And very few companies, except for the most desperate, have tried to release anything else with motion controls uh, featuring dance-based mechanics. Uh, The Wii's waggle controls ultimately got turfed out with the introduction of the Wii U. The Move was ultimately turfed out by Sony for years until the reinvention of the PlayStation VR that suddenly made the Move controllers viable again. Yeah. But uh, real quick, uh, thinking about thinking about like comparison, thinking about to Dance Central versus uh, compared to Just Dance as far as their, their philosophies of their design. So like you know, as we all know, Just uh, Dance Central, it was yeah, you're da- you're dancing you're dancing with the connect to to the moves on the screen, but it it, it was it, they actually it was pretty accurate as far, they it was accurate as far as recognizing the motion and it scored you it scored you on your accuracy. Oh yeah, like I mean, I have not played Dance Central. Three, I think, is the one that I have in about a year at this point. Yeah. But for a period of time, I would do that daily because it was it, it hit me pretty hard as a workout. Yeah, and that was surprisingly accurate in so far as its motion tracking went. You could, if you understood the choreography and you knew what was coming up, you could score pretty high without feeling particularly frustrated with yeah. the way that the Kinect picked up your motions. Yeah, and then as opposed to if you look at look at Just Dance. They they t- just answered took more of a philosophy of this. They, they 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 weren't as stringent as far as your accuracy as your motions. As long as you had something, if as long as you're doing something within con- kind of what this what you're doing on on the screen, it it uh they let it let you keep going. So it it, it in a way it, ca- it catered more toward a like just a casual crowd. Yeah, and it's it's interesting too that. That particular market didn't get nearly as oversaturated, though, let us be honest, Ubisoft didn't bother to learn any of the fucking lessons that anybody else fucking learned, and did kind of heavily oversaturate the market with Just Dance games during that brief window of time where it was viable to do so. Yeah. From 2009 to 2006, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 fucking games, as well as spin-off games including the Disney series, Disney Party, uh, the Just Dance Kids series, yeah. um, the the three different experience games in the Michael Jackson experience, the Black Eyed Peas experience, and the Hip Hop Dance experience, which I reviewed and was not particularly impressed by. (laughs) Smurf Dance Party, ABBA, You Can Dance, blah, 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 blah. Just so many fucking spinoffs. Ubisoft learned nothing from any of the other failures of any of these other people and beat that fucking shit into the ground. But yet it's it's still selling somehow. I mean... Not not to the extent that it was when it first came out. Bear in mind that the first the first two games did really well to the point where, despite the fact that the first game was not exactly a critical darling by any stretch of the imagination, yeah. it outsold fucking Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. <laughs> Which is insane. Yeah. Just Dance 2 was the best-selling non-Nintendo game for the Wii. 
it it that was a big franchise during its yeah. first couple of years. These days, I'm sure it's just a franchise that makes some cash for the company. Yeah, but like it it, it was not a particular thing that did anything to cultivate a greater audience or keep the audience going. And they just said, let's throw 30 fucking games out there and hope that they all make money. Meanwhile, Dance Central, because Harmonix at least seems to have learned some type of lesson from what happened, yeah. only saw four releases. Granted, it was within five years. It was within four years, so that's... No, five years. Uh, so that's maybe not the best comparison, but there were no weird side projects. There were no attempts to release two, three, and four games in a calendar year. It was just a game a year, and they would develop the games in different ways as time went on. So it's... You try to evolve it, at least in some ways. You try yeah. To... And it's... With the death of motion controlling, of motion controllers pretty much in general at this point, I feel like we've kind of seen the death of motion-based dance games. The Kinect is no longer a mandatory peripheral for the Xbox One, and yeah. Microsoft has more or less accepted that it is dead. Sony has only bothered to resurrect the move for the purposes of the PlayStation VR. So it's, at this point, motion-based dancing games were, were pretty much on the way out. Yeah. And that kind of brings us to today, where we have two different rhythm games that came from unlikely sources that are, while nowhere near the popularity of things like, you know, the, the dancing games and things of that nature... Yeah are pretty much carrying the rhythm genre on their back at this point. Uh, the first is the newly resurrected rock band. Less so Guitar Hero, though that was also resurrected. And the second is the Project Diva series. Now, rock band, we don't really need to get into too much, because we've already said plenty about the damn thing. Yeah. Rock band was resurrected by Harmonix entirely on their own this time, not with any backing from anyone, because Harmonix saw that there was potential value in trying to bring that franchise back into the marketplace. It did well enough by all indications. Uh, they've actually released not only a bunch of extra song packs for it, but they are in the process of, if they have not already done so, releasing a DLC package for the game that I have issues with, shall we say? But at the very least, by all indications, they've managed to make their money back on it, by all indications. Uh, Rock Band Rivals came out October 18th. Mm. So it's... That's a thing. Yeah. Guitar Hero also saw a reinvention back in 2015 with Guitar Hero Live, where the company completely changed the mechanics of how the guitar controller worked. Totally, totally made a whole new guitar controller with all new mechanics that worked off of a more touch-sensitive functionality, yeah. um, and a three-button fret system. It was very interesting conceptually, especially with the weird full, uh, FMV style of the game, where you would be playing oh, yeah. in front of an actual audience who would boo the shit out of you if you were doing poorly, and cheer you on if you were doing well. It had some interesting ideas, but from a financial perspective, I have not heard good things about where they chose to go with that. Yeah. So. I don't know where these are ultimately going to go since no further sequels have been announced to the games, and by all indications, Harmonix in particular has said that they just want Rock Band 4 to be a front-end for the current console generation so that you can release songs into it, you can release expansions to it yeah. as needed without having to release brand new $60 games and $40, $50, $60 peripherals, which well, is smart. Yeah, really, it's far and interesting. You know, you mentioned like uh, you're talking just now about the that new guitar they had did for guitar, uh, guitar Hero Live, as opposed to we look at Rock Band Four and its initial marketing. They're they're marketing, they're advertising the fact that the hey, you can if you, you still have you still have these plastic instruments in your house, you, you can reuse them. Yeah, I thought that was a really smart idea, honestly, just because it kind of said, you know what. We understand why you were pissed off with the fact yeah. that we oversaturated every fucking thing as far <laughs> as it relates to the plastic instrument genre. We're sorry, and we want to make it up to you. Now, it wasn't perfectly handled. Not all of the stuff that was released was compatible with the adapters, and to be honest, I just bought a damn guitar and moved on with my life at that point. Yeah, But it, it, it was baby steps, you know? Yeah. It, it was definitely 
a good idea. It it's, definitely it, did what it, they needed to do with it. Yeah, it was, it was really much them trying to put, extend an olive branch to for as an apology for everything, all the shit that's gone down years before. <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And they definitely handled that part of it correctly. I don't necessarily think that their further decisions where they tried to kickstart a PC version of the of Rock Band 4 and then subsequently kickstarted Amplitude for the PS4 were handled particularly well. Yeah. Especially because Amplitude came across, which just came out this year for reference purposes, as a very EDM-heavy, very limited appeal, very non-robust play experience that, while aesthetically interesting, couldn't compete with other games in the genre at the time that it came out. And then when you start comparing it to other things that have been released, just in that general time frame on the indie marketplace, it's it's really hard to look at that game and say, yes, this was worth the money that we, we put into trying to get this out into the world. I mean, bear in mind, the amp- Amplitude when it came out was a neat idea. The Amplitude of 2016 is going up against things like Crypt of the Necrodancer, yeah. which was, you know, um, an odd rhythm dungeon crawler. Or later on this year, Thumper, which is basically the most logical next step in the idea of attempting to make a amplitude style game heavy on challenge heavy on aesthetic beauty interesting in its structure and themes just just an all-around great idea and of course there's the re-release of res for the vr which i didn't get a chance to do anything with that yet but from what i saw you playing of it uh on the live stream where you were playing it 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 looked like an amazing evolution to the experience oh definitely just to touch on it definitely was i mean I mean, you you can still played you still played with just a controller like the like the like well the original game and the 360 port. Oh yeah, playing but playing with VR was quite a different experience for it. It made, it, it was definitely a lot more immersive. And made, so like with with the headset on and the ear, earphones on, your pretty much every all my all my my set my sights and hearing is very dedicated straight to the game. And then on the other side of things. And this is this is something you're going to be a lot more qualified to talk about than I am, yeah. I think. Yeah. Around about this time, just in general, we started seeing the rise of a character who really hadn't been anything in, in so far as gaming was concerned. Yeah. Uh, in Hatsune Miku, uh, via the Project Diva series from Sega. Now, I do know that Hatsune Miku did not come from the Project Diva series, no. uh, but rather from a really odd, mostly Japanese-specific uh, project called the Vocaloid Project. Yeah. Which I mean, is essentially a, a tool that you use on your computer to make music. Yeah, it's basically it's basically a, a voice synthesizer software. Basically, you, you basically you put in, you, you put in words and you put in words into the, into the software and you tune it and you it basically it basically sings the word what you put in there, and you can tweak you tweak the you you, you can tweak its to the tone and everything. Now I'm not 100 percent sure how Sega came from that concept and said, you know what, we can make a rhythm game off of that. But they did, and <laughs> yeah. the first couple of games did not make it to the U.S. Nope. I mean, first off, the games originate on PSP for first thing. Uh, yeah, and I I know I want to say Dingo was involved in developing yes dingo was involved in developing those games to a certain extent um which for those who have followed anything that i've done for a period will note uh they were also originally involved in the development of persona 4 dancing all night before being tossed off the project like a little a little over midway through yeah but it's interesting that none of those games has to the best of my knowledge, come to the U.S. in any capacity. Uh, no, like they're... even in their re-releases. What's that? Like even in like the um the, the the re-released versions that came out on the PlayStation Three. Yeah, so like all well, so the first three games of the series 
Tardic Diva, Tardic Diva Second, and, and Diva Extend. Yeah, they never made they never made stateside at all. And then a lot their their PS3 counterparts never released that they, they never made it either. It was it was it, the the series uh, the series didn't actually debut in the US until uh Project Diva F on the PS3 which was I want to say 2012. Well, which it came out in 2012 in Japan. Okay, in 2013, uh March of 2013 for the PlayStation 3. Yeah, I remember picking that one up and being impressed with it at the time, but I had no idea that it was going to become I mean, it's not it's not on the level of something like DDR or Rock Band, let's yeah. be clear. But I had no idea it was going to become the thing that it is now, just from playing it. Oh, I mean, it's interesting. Like, the uh, Vocaloid in general had was uh, back in prior to two, like say 2010, before 2010, it wasn't a huge thing. It was only it was free in Japan only. But uh, Vocaloid as a culture have grown growing over these last what six years. And like to the point, like uh, it may surprise you. It didn't surprise me so. It didn't surprise me so much because, uh, as far as what F, uh, Diva F's release here, uh, if you remember, Sega had, they, Sega uh, actually put uh, in 2013. They they put up a poll asking if hey if if we if we if we bring over Diva F, would you guys buy it? And they got such an incredibly overwhelming response to that poll, and they that they they did release it. <laughs> Yeah, and it's they um they posted that back in March it looks like basically saying you know do you want it and that response was the only reason that game came out in 2013. Pretty much. And to be fair, Sega is a company that has definitely taken fan response to heart in general as well as in recent years. Let us not forget, they came to the fans and said, "Listen, we really need Valkyria Valkyria Chronicles to be a success. Can you please help us?" And the fan base said, "Yo, we got this." And yeah. made that game a million seller, which Sega was not expecting. Yes. They were the ones that came to the fan base and said, look, we know that we've been screwing up, we're sorry, and we're going to do better. They were the ones who listened when fans objected to Yakuza 3's elimination of dating cafes and made sure to bring Yakuza 4 over to the U.S. as intact as possible. So it's they've clearly been receptive to what fans want, so long as what fans want isn't a good Sonic game. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. So it's 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 interesting that Sega was willing to even take that chance to say, "Hey, would you pay money for this?" But it's not necessarily surprising. It's just interesting that they thought that that might even do well in the states. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's interesting to think. But then again, like if if you if uh, I guess I, I'd imagine they had someone at Sega who's been look, looking at this. Look, well, probably one someone in Sega who's also interested in in this series and in voc- and possibly Vocaloid in general, who who probably who probably pitched the idea of hey, what look look what's look how this has actually been kind of growing, because like up up to the, up to this point, like the voc- like I said, Vocaloid has been grow- was has been steadily growing uh, bit by bit. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting too to think about it. Like these games came out, the first one came out in the U.S. market space in 2013. Yeah. I want to say it was 2014, the first time that I saw any type of non-gaming reference to Hatsune Miku, I think you know what I'm talking about, yeah. was in promotion for the New York, I don't remember the name of it. Miku Expo? Miku Expo, there we go. Where they had a fucking Hatsune Miku, Miku. on David Letterman. <laughs> of course. That poor man seemed like he had no idea what was going on in the world <laughs> at that moment. I, I, I'm not, I, to be honest, like, like his, his look on his face when he's just when he's uh, introducing her, he's probably he's just like he's probably thinking back of his head, what am I doing here? <laughs> like, what is this? Yeah, and I mean, it wasn't really like that was that weird because it wasn't like gorillas wasn't a thing or anything. No, I mean we've had digital musicians in various capacities for years at this point. Yeah. Uh, there was a Tupac hologram at Coachella. Yeah. We've had gorillas as a digital band for several years at this point so for those who have been involved in music the idea of a digital pop star a digital character wasn't new yeah but the presentation of miku yeah it's in theory that probably could have been handled better but it's worth noting as awkward as that came off that video went viral oh definitely i saw that thing everywhere because it was just so weird right yeah 
two years later, Miku Expo comes back. How many cities did they do this year? <laughs> ten. In North, in North America, ten. And how many did they do in 2014? Two. Yeah. That's not nothing. No, not at all. We're at the point now where we've consistently seen at least one Hatsune Miku game pretty much every year at this point. Um, Since 2013. Uh, 2013 saw Project Eva F. F. 2014 saw Project Eva F second. Yep. 2015 saw the 3DS game. I want to say it was Mirai DX. Yeah, that's the only. That's uh, there's there were I think there were three Mirai games I believe, but only only DX came over to the U.S. Yeah, and then this year we got Project Eva X, as yep. well as the VR. I don't necessarily know if I want to call it a game. Well, no, it's, it's let's not be reductive. No, the VR game. That they released. I don't remember what the name of it was, but I watched uh, you live stream that as yeah, well. It, yeah, how did you make it? VR Future Live. VR Future Live. And that one's going to be individual components that can be kind of connected together, more or less. Yeah. And we've already got acknowledgement that Future Tone is coming to the U.S. Yep, we just got that just days... Well, I think, yeah, I think literally yesterday. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to realize, you know... We've seen so many franchises just completely bail out on the genre. Like, we've just seen so many just die off. Yeah. But it's, I really feel like of all the companies that we've talked about here, Sega is the one that's handling this in the right way. Oh, definitely. Like they are releasing different games on different platforms each year, and they're restricting it to one game a year with the exception of this year, and that's only because... The VR platform is an important place to have a product in its first year of com- of competition. Yeah, and also with the, as far as the VR game, it's very much a very different thing from any the, any, any of the other ones. Yeah, it's it, it felt much less like the standard rhythm games where you would push buttons in specific timing or hold buttons in specific timing, and yeah. more a case of your actual animation while watching Miku perform. So it it, it kind of felt more like simulating the effect of going to Miku Expo rather than playing a traditional rhythm game. Yes. So it's, I feel like this is probably not going to be the franchise that reinvigorates us for third for... impact or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, that was, that was on purpose. I'm sorry, but <laughs> <clears throat> for, for third impact or whatever, as far as, as far as rhythm games go, this is, this is not going to be the franchise that, you know, no. turns it around completely. But, I do legitimately feel like this is the franchise that's going to keep rhythm games going for a while because Sega's handling it correctly. They're not just pumping out game after game. They're not porting the stuff that used to exist. And from the success of Hatsune Miku, we are seeing other niche titles get a fair shot in the marketplace. Persona 4 Dancing All Night would probably not exist as it does without the Project Diva series. No, definitely not. As I said during the musical podcast, I think we're probably going to start seeing the more niche games. Like, I don't think we're going to see the full-on idle simulators anytime soon. No. Or, you know, the, the idle heavy dancing games. But I do think we'll probably see something like Idle Death Game TV make its way to the U.S. because something like Hatsune Miku paved the way for it to potentially be a success. I do feel, and I, I feel like this is probably, like, the point to end on here. From my perspective, I do feel like it's really sad that the caretakers of the genre beat the shit out of these franchises. Yeah, whenever they had that opportunity. Yeah, they definitely did, and it's whether whether it's of their own accord or by the uh, the corporate uh, corporate uh, corporate uh, businessmen uh, further up the chain. It's it's still a sad thing to see. It really is, and it's it's a shame that it took us this long to get to a point where we have a franchise that is both being carried by a unique, specific, likable character, and is being handled in the correct way. Because Lord knows, multiple companies, Sega being the most consistent, have been trying to get over that kind of character for years in the Western market space at this point. Again, Samba de Amigo, Ooh La La. There's almost certainly more I'm not even thinking of, but Rez was definitely along those same lines. They've yeah. been trying to get those character experience-driven rhythm games over for years and never could. Sony tried with Parappa the Rappa, and they did get three games, four games out of it, but 
it was never a, a really financially successful franchise for them in the strictest sense. Yeah. And then we're also seeing a company that has a modicum of success with this in Sega, again, who's not looking at this and going, let's show 15 games out in the span of two years. That'll go over really well. And it's, I, I really feel like that is the thing that the genre needed to stay consistent. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're not... The, they're not. They're not. They're not. They're not. Uh, being driven by. Well, they're not driven by greed to try to make to make the to, to, to the business and make make pro make as much profit in a uh, little time as possible. I don't know where you see the genre in five years, but me personally, I see Hatsune Miku being a useful gateway for other ideas. Most definitely. Like we've already seen again, Tokyo Mirage Sessions come out, bringing it back to the musical concept where they tried to combine a JRPG with musical and J and J pop style elements. And while it wasn't the seller that the Persona games were, it was definitely a game that both Nintendo and Atlas were satisfied with by their own indications. Yeah. And we've started to see games that might not necessarily have come to the US get those chances. Again, Persona 4 Dancing All Night, various Korean developed rhythm games have come out for the Vita in the past few years. Vita, Vita and PSP, the DJ, the DJ Max. DJ Max, yes, DJ Max. That's that's definitely a big one. There was one Super Sonic, I want to say. That uh, came out. Uh, Super uh, Super uh, Sonic Super uh, Super Beat, I think. There you go. That's it. It, Sonic it, Super it, it was it was like the, it's a spiritual successor to the DJ Max series. Yeah, Aaron's listening to this right now and going, "Fuck you! Why don't you know the name of this?" <laughs> it's it's we're we're seeing more and more of these games get that opportunity that they wouldn't have had 10 years ago. Yeah. Maybe even five years ago. And that's, that's important. You know, we're, we're seeing that genre continue to hold on and actually make slow, but steady, consistent growth. Yeah. It's, it's not the explosion of something like a rock band and it shouldn't be. No. And I, I feel like with, the slow, consistent growth where we're seeing people who are identifying with the character of Miku, who are identifying with the, the genre, who are just attaching onto it organically instead of in a massive popularity explosion and then deflation. And I think we're getting to the point where the rhythm genre is finally going to be a long-standing genre instead of one that's a lot of fits and starts. Yeah. And I don't feel like there's another opportunity for them to blow it up again hopefully but i'm definitely i'm definitely expecting we're going to start seeing some more both really interesting experimental games from the indie crowd again krypton necro dancer and thumper are perfect yeah. examples yeah. and also start to see some really awesome ideas come out of japan yeah i mean there's a, there's already there's a lot of nice ideas already coming out of japan that just haven't had a chance to come over here but uh, yeah as you're saying like with how with how the the slow gro the slower growth right now as opposed to the explosions of the of rock band and things like that, it allow, it allows allows the the genre to probably be a little more be actually more a little more nurtured and mature a little mature. And I think I think it's also worth noting that it's probably due not in small part to the fact that people are paying attention to the music that they're making for these games that we're starting to see a lot more players who casually love the music that they're getting out of games yeah and sure we have the ability to share this music around so you start seeing you know osts being available for download on steam or even purchasable through you know importing markets things like that yeah and we're starting to see fans love the music that they get exclusively from these games so you know again like indie developers like crypt and the necro dancer uh, again thumper making these games where the music not only matters but is also teaching the gamers that the music matters and i think that's not nothing either and i feel like the further we get into that where gamers start actively loving the music to the extent that like you know people people like us who've been around on it for years and know yeah. the names of developers like you know Yuzo Koshiro and shit like that yeah you know, Akira Toriyama. Uh, no, not Akira Toriyama. Fuck. Akira Yamaoka. <laughs> yeah. God, that was stupid. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Akira Yamaoka. We are starting to see more and more people know the names of artists, the names of composers who only do video game music and identify with that. And it's, I feel like that love for video game music, that love for what they're hearing while they play is finally getting us to that point where 
more and more people are starting to jump onto the appreciation of rhythm games not as a genre that allows them to play through their favorite top 40 hits, but rhythm games as a genre that allows them to listen to what video game composers can do. Yeah, what video game composers do, and also get be exposed to some, exposed to some, uh, uh, some music that they may not have even thought, thought of listening to, or even, even checked out before. Yeah, and I mean, if nothing else, I really hope the genre holds on uh, for long enough now that we have a brand new Daytona game that Hatsune Miku will eventually convert Daytona Let's Go Away into a song for the franchise. <laughs> uh, I'm sh- I am imagine there's probably some uh, producer out there who may, may have done that cover, a cover of that already. I mean, we already, have, we already have a cover. We already have covers for the Afterburner theme. We have a cover for Magical, uh, you have Magical Sun Shower. That magical uh, sound shower theme from Mount Run. Yeah, and the the Afterburner two track, the title track, was really good too. I thought. Yeah. So it's, I don't know. I have hope for the future, and I I feel like I feel like everybody I've talked to who does pay attention to it, Aaron Soroyce, uh, Robert Hubbs, and yourself, share in that hope. Yeah. I'm hoping that that bears out, just because I don't know. I'm I'm happy with where things are now. I don't. I don't need everything to be the new hotness. I'm just glad that we have these things around and that they're just consistent. Yes. But I feel like that is as good a place as any to wrap up the discussion for today. Uh, I do want to say thank you once again to Mr. Joe Tran for joining me today. I, I really do appreciate it. It was really beneficial, especially as far as the timing on this went. Yeah, no problem. So for those of you who have been around for a while, you know the deal by now. But if you're coming in new... Do us all a favor. If you like what you heard today, like it, subscribe it, and leave a comment. You can find us on SoundCloud, on uh, soundcloud.com slash markbwriting, and you can find the podcast listed on iTunes, Google Music, Stitcher, and basically anywhere else that hosts podcasts. For me, uh, if you want to follow along with what's going on, uh, you can follow me on Twitter over at markbwriting. I literally just spent like three hours massively bombing my Twitter with Persona 5 updates from the live stream, so... That's a thing if you're interested. Uh, you can also follow me over on Facebook at Mark B. Writing Home. Uh, Joe, what do you want to plug? So if you want to follow me, on, tr- I'm also on Twitter at JT4MTB. Uh, I probably, well, I probably tweet, I tweet, I tweet, about, I tweet about games. I also tweet about uh, my live streams. Uh, like I, I, I live stream probably try to give you games on Twitch every Tuesday and Thursday night. Uh, what's your Twitch handle? Uh, Twitch, uh, yeah, Twitch, uh, Twitch page sells the same. Uh, the, uh, JT4MTB. All right. Join us next week when our topic will be Why Yoane Haku is the Best Waifu. On behalf of Mr. Joe Tran, my name is Mark B. saying stay safe out there, junkers.